should all be out of breath. We should all be out of breath. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm tell you, if the mic comes on, you're going to be deafened. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. The light is off. It's okay. Praise God. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause to whoever. I want to know whether Salt Church, you can keep a secret. Can you keep it? Just bear in mind, I'll be preaching soon about gossip from James. But I want to know, can you keep a secret? You can. Let me tell you a secret. Jesus Christ is risen. Let me tell you a secret. In case you didn't hear it, Jesus Christ is risen. And I tell you, I give you permission, church. This is a secret you are not to keep. This is a secret where we go out in the highways and the byways and we declare, Jesus Christ is risen. Hallelujah. So when I say the words, because you're just warming up, aren't you? When I say the words, Christ is risen, I want you to shout at the top of your voices, Alleluia, he is risen indeed. Can you remember that? Yes. Yeah? So when I say Christ is risen, at the top of your voices, you respond, Alleluia, he is risen indeed. Are you up for this? Yes. Yeah, remember, this is a secret we don't want to keep. Christ is risen! Yeah, that's pretty good. Well done. Give yourselves a round of applause. I tell you, if there's um, ever a Sunday to be cheerful, to raise the roof and to clap and to sing and to smile, then today has to be it. I want to welcome everybody here to the service, everybody who's watching online. Uh, it's so good that you've chosen to be with us today on this uh, Resurrection Sunday, the day of the year where Christians throughout the world come together in unity, in unity, setting aside any differences, but in unity to celebrate. Our Savior is not dead. He is alive. Hallelujah. There is no other founder of any religion. No founder of any religion. And there's loads of religions in the world that go back millennia. But there's no founder of any religion who is alive today. And... For those that are starting new religions today, those human beings, those little specks, those who are starting new religions today, I'll tell you a secret, they're all going to die. There's only one founder of a religion who is alive today. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Is there anybody new who has dared come into this place this morning who's new? Anyone who's not been here before who wants to put up? Yes, we've got someone here. Let's give them a Salt Church welcome. Welcome to you. Anybody else? Yes, on the front row. Hallelujah. Welcome to you. Anyone further back? Yes, on the back row. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's so good that you're here with us. Uh, we, we want to get to know you at the end of the service. Do go for a cup of coffee at the welcome table. People will come and speak to you. Hallelujah. We're going to open in prayer. And um, just want to open in prayer for some people who are, who are ill. Just a quick update about Marcia. 
Uh, she's progressing day by day. There's a long way to go. But we thank God that the improvement is being visible and can be seen. There is a way to go. We want to pray for her mind, want to pray for the headaches that she's having, that they will disappear. And if Marcia and Paul, if you've managed to be watching today from, from a hospital, then a great welcome to you. We are praying for you and uh, we love you and we are expecting in the Lord Jesus complete and full recovery. Amen. Amen. We continue to pray. I mean, we pray as a church. We've got a, a, a health line. Um, we've got a, a wealth line. No, no, we've got a health line. And we've got a pastoral care team who pray for people. And we have our prayer team after the service who pray. And I just want to mention Sandra Robbins, who's um, recovering but still very, very uh, ill. And, and, and for Mike, her husband, and for... Uh, Helena, you've noticed Helena's been a bit sick at the moment. She's not here today. Well done to the worship team. Hallelujah. What a baptism of fire on Resurrection Sunday for, uh, for Catherine uh, to, to actually be lead singer uh, here this morning. So well done. And um, we just want to lift people. You will all know and you'll have people on your hearts that you were praying for. And we want to be reminded that there is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is risen from the grave. He's concerned about our concerns. He's concerned about his kids. He's concerned about people. And so let's just open in prayer. And you can offer up your own prayer in your heart or, 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 or out loud for those that you know who are sick at the moment. Far in heaven, Lord, on Resurrection Sunday, where death is defeated, Lord, and Jesus burst forth triumphantly. Lord, we want to bring those that we know who are sick on this special day before you. Lord, we want to pray that you would minister to their needs. Lord, you know exactly what they need. And uh, Lord, we just pray that your presence will be with them, that they will know that you are there, that you care for them. And Lord, that you would do your thing, only the things that you can do, Lord, in their lives. So, Lord, we pray for people to recover. We pray for those that we know, those that the congregation here are raising up in their minds or, or, or speaking out loud. We bring all of these people before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I have to say, Jesus Christ is our vision here at Salt Church, isn't he? Be thou my vision. And uh, we've been singing uh, these resurrection songs that Jesus has burst forth out of the grave, that the, the, the folded grave clothes, the grave clothes were folded up, meaning that he was coming back to the table, meaning that he's going to come back again. He's, he's not quite finished yet. He's done remarkable things, but he's coming back to claim his people to himself in the new heaven and the new earth, and we will rule and reign with him for eternity. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Do you know the resurrection is so important? We'll be thinking about that uh, absolutely later on. So God bless you. Welcome to everybody. And now over to Anne to bring our notices. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. Uh, Pastor Andy Neal returns on Wednesday, the 3rd of April, at 6 p.m. to continue his second study on Daniel. So come along and listen to his teaching with Daniel 6, The Lion's Den. We've been eagerly awaiting this as it had been interrupted due to illness. The trip to Murcia Spring Flower Festival that takes place this Thursday, the 4th of April, is now closed. The two pickup points and times are as follows. Quesada bus stop near the arches at 1.35 for 12 people and Playa Flamenca at 2.15 for three people. Unfortunately, the coach we are on is not picking up at Entre Narejos or La Marina. So please speak to Barbara immediately after the service for clarification if needed. On Friday, the 5th of April, we invite you to our monthly prayer meeting held here at Salt Church at 10 a.m. Please do come along as we gather together as a church family. Prayer is the most powerful tool we have to connect with God, and everyone is welcome. 
Prayer for Israel is also taking place this Friday, the 5th of April, starting at 6 p.m. So please come along and join them. They meet every fortnight to pray for the nation of Israel. Come along and join them. Everyone is welcome. And come and see what the group is about. Ladies, the next eagerly awaited Salt Sisters event takes place on Saturday, the 27th of April at 11 o'clock. This event is entitled Time to Testify. So come along and listen as several seasoned Salt Sisters share some special stories. I don't know what seasoning these ladies are using, but it promises to be a very tasty morning, so don't miss it. Sign up at reception today. Bring a friend, neighbor, or relative along for a great time of fellowship and sharing. This is a coffee and cake event, so you'll know what's coming next. Yes, ladies, bake or buy a cake and bring it along ready sliced. You will hear some amazing stories and you'll have some fab cakes to go with it. And finally, please continue with your generous food donations, which this month will be going to a Helping Hand food bank. Thank you all in advance for your generous support. You are incredible. And one last thing actually, there's a brooch that was left a couple of Sundays ago, which if it belongs to you, would you please go to reception after the service. Thank you. That's all from me. Have a blessed week, everyone. Carol, we're going to try the head mic to see if it's working. One, two, one, two, one, two. No, not working. Okay. So, so I'm going to be using a handheld mic. I'm going to be juggling up here when it comes to the sermon, but that's okay, I'm a multitasker. Not many men are multitaskers, but I'm one of them. Now, we come to our opportunity to give to the work of the Lord. And um, we know that Jesus gave everything to us and he loves cheerful givers and all of those things. And this is one day when we're really cheerful because we know that our Lord and Savior lives. So we're gonna play some music, the words are gonna come up whilst um, the uh, collection baskets go around. If you've not come prepared, do not worry. Let the basket just pass from you. Um, and, um, but you can join in. Uh, the words will be up on the screen and we can sing this song. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, we are so grateful for everything you have done for us. And today we are reminded of your love that ran red on that morning, that you rose again on the Sunday. Lord, we are so grateful. And we want you to use this, these tithes and offerings to the extension of your kingdom, Lord, and to the furthering of, of, of our ministries here on earth. In your lovely and precious name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Do you feel the world is broken? Oh, at the cross. It's all right, oh, Ken. I'm sorry. He's got the wrong words in front of him. We can make that. We can change that. Don't worry. It was no only more. Love ran red. <laughs> Beautiful. Lovely solo there.
Wasn't that good? Yes. My goodness. Fantastic to sing the praises of the risen Lord. Can you remember the secret I told you not to keep? What is it? The front row, 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10 front row. That secret I told you that you must not keep, what is it? Well done, well done. So, if you want to take uh, your Bibles or your electronic device with Bibles on it, we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. And in my Bible, it's entitled, the, wow, the best title it could have, The Resurrection of of Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, there are 58 verses in this chapter and I deliberated should we read all 58 of them and I thought well, you probably wouldn't take all of it in so I've only read the first eight verses and I would recommend at some point today on this Resurrection Sunday that you go and read chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians and you read all 58 verses it is absolutely packed with great stuff so I suggest on this Resurrection Sunday that you, that you read it, that you read it, you will get so much from it, so when you get home, do it. 
And this whole passage is about the resurrection of Christ and some of the arguments that people were throwing at Paul to say that Jesus hadn't actually really risen. But it is Paul's contention that Jesus is risen from the dead. And Paul gives proof physically, also philosophically, and of course scripturally, that the resurrection of Christ has indeed happened. He is risen. Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. And you, being great scholars of the Bible, or certainly understanding the fullness of the gospel, you would have recognized from our reading that our Bible reading is the gospel in a nutshell. You would do well just to remember these things that I have read to you. And if anyone asks you anything about why do you believe, it's all here in these verses. It is a step-by-step -step belief of our Christian faith. It is known as a biblical creed. And a creed is simply a statement of the Christian faith. And it's one for us to hold deep in our hearts because we can learn it and know it. And when someone asks, we can then give it to them. In love, of course. Amen. It's a biblical creed. And Paul stated this. First, that Christ died for our sins. Hallelujah. Do you know, when I was looking into religion, when I was looking into, if I was going to be religious, which religion would I follow? And I looked at them, I was actually looking for what has the religion done for me? If I can't save myself and I know that I'm a sinner, then what has any religion actually done for me to solve my innate problem? The problem that I can't do what is right and I keep doing what is wrong. And as I was looking across the religions, there was one that rose mighty above all else. And it rose mighty above all else because Jesus came from heaven. He came personally to do something for me. And I found that outstanding. I found that incredible. In the old days, and when you watch all the movies and you see all this stuff, the king would sit on a high place out of the battle. He would be at the back and he'd be orchestrating a bit here and a bit there, but not King Jesus. Jesus came from heaven and he came down to earth and he immersed himself in the battle. The battle with the evil one. The battle to pay the price for my sin and for your sin. And so Jesus just rose. And it didn't take me very long to discount all other religions and philosophies of men because of the exclusivity of the Christian faith that God in Christ, Jesus, who is God, died for me. Hallelujah. Well done, front row. <laughs> the, infectiousness of the, the infectiousness of the front row is going to filter backwards. And there's going to be a lovely wave coming backwards and forwards as people are saying, thank God for Jesus. He is a king who got his hands dirty. He took on my mess. He came down into my pit. He pulled me up and out. And he paid the price for my sin. So this biblical creed, the first part of our gospel, is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. This Easter, we've gone through the Easter story, and we went through the Passover on Wednesday. Over 80 of us actually learning about the Passover, that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, that he came and we sang a song. He came to bleed and his blood is shed that we might be forgiven and covered and set free. The whole history of the mission of Jesus Christ, of course, is in the scriptures. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is why the Bible is so important. The Bible is the story of God. It's the story of Jesus. It's the story of Jesus and his people. It's the story of us. We are written in by faith according to the scriptures. So Jesus came as the servant king to be our Passover lamb, to take away the sins of the world, to personalize it, to take away your sin, and to take away my sin. Second, 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 
Wow. We might need to do a manual second. Okay. A second in our creed. Jesus Christ was buried physically in a tomb. Jesus truly died. His spirit left his body. And we saw on Friday that Jesus had his last drink that was given to him on that little plant called hyssop, a picture of cleansing, and then Jesus died. He gave up his spirit to God. In Luke 23, 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. And we also know the story, don't we? To check that he was dead, the spear came into his side. Jesus died and he was buried physically in the tomb. And the third part of our creed is this, that Christ was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. When those in Israel saw Jesus and they said, show us a sign, prove who you are, show us that you're God, show us that you're the king of the Jews. He said, you adulterous generation, you will get a sign, but it's this one. It will be the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was dead and buried in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so Christ will be dead and buried in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. And as the whale chucked Jonah out, he came back alive and he converted the Ninevites. The grave could not hold Jesus. The underworld could not hold Jesus. Jesus said what he needed to say. He proved who he was to all of the spiritual forces around him. And he burst forth out of the grave, out from death. And he burst forth and he rose again on the third day. The sign of Jonah was fulfilled. First, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Second, he was buried physically in a tomb. Third, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And fourth, Christ appeared to men and women as proof of his resurrection. As proof of his resurrection. He came to Cephas, to the 12 apostles, to 500 brothers and sisters, it says in Scripture at the same time. Oh, I don't know if they were all in one place and he turned up or whether they were scattered. And he turned up at the same time across everyone because Jesus is no longer confined by time and space. He is all-powerful. He is risen from the grave. He's in a resurrected body and he can be and do what he pleases. Amen. Christ then appeared, as we know, to his brother James. We're studying the book of James at the moment, aren't we? James, his brother, was not yet a believer. And Jesus came to him. And James is convinced, he's convicted, and he's converted. And James becomes a great church leader. He wrote the book of James. He became a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally in this section, as Paul says, the, the bottom one, Finally, in this section, the Lord Jesus Christ appears to Paul. Paul is called, called out to become an apostle for Jesus. This Paul who persecuted Christians, this Paul who was against Christ, this Paul who was refusing to believe who Jesus was, has his Damascus Road experience. And Christ appeared to Paul. And Paul is dramatically convinced He's dramatically converted and he's convicted to preach the gospel for the rest of his entire life. And we know that Paul lost his head. He was martyred for his faith also. And when we think about all the apostles, only John died a natural death as an old man having completed the book of Revelation. These disciples, they were confused. They didn't know what was happening. Even on resurrection day when Jesus arrived, he's alive, he's alive, show me, show me. They were confused, they didn't fully understand it. And they needed to be convinced. And Jesus turned up 
and he convinced them, it is I, it is me. And you remember Thomas, don't you? Thomas said, I won't believe it until I see his hands and I put my hand in his side. And Jesus turns up and said, well, come on then, Thomas. And Thomas just declared, my Lord and my God. He was convinced, he was convicted, and Thomas was converted. He's the first to declare that Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, the power of the resurrection, it changed their lives. It changed them from weak and feeble and just following this teaching, this person. It became global. And they were prepared to die for their faith. They were prepared to die because they knew it was true. They were prepared to die because they were convinced, they were convicted. They knew that Christ had risen from the dead. And finally, we know that Paul, as I've said, was martyred. The apostles were martyred. And when we come to the early believers, we see that the believers, that's just like you and me, the early believers, as the news is traveling, as they're believing the eyewitness accounts, as some of them have seen the risen Christ, but not all of them saw the risen Christ. They believed because of the testimony of the people at the time. They believed because of what they'd seen, what they'd heard about happening in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified on a cross. The graves opened, the sky went black, there were earthquakes and all these things. The early believers saw themselves as witnesses to the resurrection. Do you know that you and I are witnesses to the resurrection? We are witnesses to the resurrection by the faith that we have in Jesus. Why? Because we've been convinced, we have been convicted, and we have been converted to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we say yes to Jesus, the light bulb goes on. We've come from darkness into light. But when we say yes to Jesus, it all makes sense. We have Holy Spirit comes into us, and we come alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have something in us, an engine that says, I want to tell everybody about the resurrected Jesus. He is alive. So the early believers, they, they saw themselves as witnesses to the resurrection. And Peter and John, well, they created uproar because they were preaching about Jesus and the resurrection in Acts chapter 4. People had never heard this sort of thing before. God has come, he's died on a cross, and now he's alive, and he, he's come to change you. Bow your knee to the Lord Jesus. The Bible says with great power that the apostles testified constantly to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indeed, several years after the crucifixion, while preaching in Athens, Paul preached the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Do you know, I have to say that uh, this is a challenge to us, isn't it? I tell people about the good news of Jesus, but let us not forget and the resurrection. We tell them about the good news of Jesus, his life, what he did on the cross, his death, but we also bring with equal power and force, he's alive today, and that means something. It is central and it's vitally important. Jesus Christ fulfilled all the scriptures according to the scriptures. Do you know, the more we know our Bibles, the more we see Jesus in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the more we read and understand, we can see Christ in all the scriptures. And he fulfilled everything said about him. And there's an awful lot because the whole book is about Jesus. And so according to the scriptures, Jesus Christ rose on the third day. He is alive. Hallelujah. Central. There's no Christianity without the resurrection. Without the resurrection, Paul says, our faith is in vain. Go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 15. No resurrection, no eternal life, nothing. We've lived our lives for no purpose. But Paul goes on to say, because of the resurrection, then there is everything. Because the scriptures speak to you and me. They say what God is going to do for us in Christ Jesus, that we too are going to be raised from the dead. There is a hope. Our life doesn't end in death. Because Christ rose, we too will also rise. Hallelujah. This chapter, 
of 1 Corinthians is an incredible chapter and it's full of encouragement and hope. And we've seen lots of lions today, haven't we? The Lion of Judah has been up on our worship. There's an incredible painting of the Lion of Judah as you came in. More about that later. Go and see Helen about that. And now here again, we have the picture of the lion, the mighty warrior. Christ is the mighty conqueror who has defeated the devil and he stamped on his head according to the scriptures. Go back to Genesis 3.15. A man is coming, Satan. Yeah, you're going to pierce him. You're going to strike him. That's a picture of the cross. But he is going to stamp on your head. It's over. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all scriptures. And then Jesus is the mighty conqueror. We've sung about it. He removes the painful sting of death. Death is defeated. You don't look very pleased about that. I mean, I have to say, you know, death is defeated. Doesn't that give us a great hope? Because Jesus rose from the grave, because the evidence is overwhelming, because we've received this by faith in our hearts, the light has gone on, and we are the part of the same promise. We too will rise with Christ and rule with him. Jesus Christ is the mighty conqueror and he has promised and we have received the transformation. We have come from darkness to light. We are a new creation. We have become born again from above by the Spirit of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It's an incredible story. In fact, Christianity is one of the most complicated religions out there. It really is. To understand all of the nuances, I've been doing this for 35 years. And yet I learned something new on Friday about hyssop. I learned something new about the finer details of the scriptures. There is always more to learn. We will never know it all until we see him face to face. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, the mighty conqueror over death, because he's conquered it, he has made a promise to you and me. Because he has risen from the dead and he's alive, that means he can keep his promises. He can keep every single promise that he has said to you. Read your Bibles and you will see the promises that Jesus has given to you. Here is what the resurrection does. And they're all important. Do you know there are so many in the world who refuse to believe that Jesus rose from the grave. They refuse. They're not Christians. You know, there were great schisms in the church. Well, he didn't really rise from the dead physically or bodily. You can't be a Christian unless you believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he's alive today. The resurrection of Jesus firstly proclaims his deity. Deity means that he is God. Some view, as I've said, the crucifixion just as a, an honorable sacrifice made by a gifted teacher. Jesus is not just a gifted teacher. Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh. He is the, the, the Son of God is one of his, his names, and he's the Son of Man is his other name. He is the God-man. The deity of Christ is proven in his resurrection. Some point to the cross and they say, well, he wasn't very powerful, this Jesus. Do you remember the, the, the thief on the cross who said, prove who you are. Come down from this cross and just obliterate everyone. Taunting him and mocking him. If you are the Messiah, then get us also down from here. Rather self-centered. So critics view the cross as an insignificant death. They, they see the death of Jesus just like the thousands of deaths of people who died on crosses because they stood against the Roman Empire. Many people just lump Jesus in with the ordinary. But no, Jesus is extraordinary according to the scriptures. He has proved it. The God-man who came, who died on a cross, who went to the grave, and who rose on the third day. 
The Bible indeed paints this picture, the one that we read from our scriptures. According to the scriptures, everything has come true. And that means that the crucifixion is not a tragedy. Do you know, I think at this time of Easter, we go through lots of emotions, we, we get sad, we, we feel the pain, and, and it is right to enter in to remember what Jesus has done for us. But actually, the crucifixion is not a tragedy. The crucifixion is a triumph. It's a triumph declared by the resurrection. Jesus has overcome death and he is alive. The apostle Paul declared the resurrection proves that Jesus was the son of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, later on, we read, Christ has conquered all enemies. He's destroyed all powers, all dominions. And there comes a time when Jesus will hand the kingdom of God over to his father. When he's finished everything, he will hand it to his father. Every single thing is under the authority of Christ because he's alive, because of the resurrection. We sang a song, who is worthy to open the scrolls? Who is worthy? No one is worthy. No religious leader is worthy to open the will of God. But only God himself in Christ Jesus is worthy to open the seals and to read what is written. And then it starts to happen. It will happen, culminating in our resurrection to eternal life, to rule with Jesus. Everything's under his authority. The tomb is empty. Jesus is the Holy Son of God, and he is worthy to receive all honor and glory and praise. So the resurrection proclaims Christ's deity, that he is the God-man. And second, the resurrection protects you and me against despair. Verse 19 says, without the resurrection, we should be pitied more than all men. Verse 32 says, without the resurrection, we should just eat, drink, and die. That's despairing, isn't it? But Jesus is alive, and he protects against a life of despair without hope. The resurrection of Christ communicates to you and me a very high purpose. We understand that in Christ, we are loved by God, our creator, and he's gone to great lengths to communicate that love in Christ to us. The resurrection reminds us that our present trials and our temptations and our struggles, they're only temporary. There is a battle that Christ has won, but we're engaged in the battle. Christ has won the battle, but we are engaged in it spiritually. And we struggle within ourselves, and we must overcome in the Lord Jesus. But the resurrection reminds that all these trials, all of our struggles are temporary. We might have to carry a cross, and it might be burdensome for a short time. But resurrection glory for us is on its way. Amen? Amen? Resurrection into eternal glory is on its way. And as James says, because of what we see coming, because of the resurrection, we can consider it pure joy when we face temptations or trials of many kinds. Because we know it strengthens our faith, but we know what is coming. Because Christ was raised from the dead, we too will be raised and live with him. We know as Christians where we are going. Our eternal destiny is assured. Do you know, when you think about despair, I came across this analogy. When you think about despair, it's like a locked door and it keeps you trapped in a room of pain. Despair is all around you and you can't get out of it. You, you can't get away from it. it. It crowds in on us. And despair comes and maybe depression comes and bad feelings come. But I want you to remember that hope is there. It might seem at a distance, but the resurrection of Jesus kicks the door in and hope comes flooding in and despair can go. There is a place where Jesus can burst into our 
lives. He can break into a locked room and he can set us free from all of the things that we are struggling with. The resurrection kicks the door open so that we can see Christ and we too can actually be saved. Amen. And third, the resurrection prepares us for our future. The resurrection is the guarantee that the promises of Christ are true. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we can't trust him. But because he did rise from the dead, then all of the promises that Jesus has made are true. You might remember that his disciples were despairing. They were in despair. You know, you're telling us, Jesus, you're going to die. Something bad's going to happen to you. Surely not. And so he said in John 14, he said, I, you know, do not be worried. Don't despair. Don't be fearful. Trust in God and trust in me. And he declared to his disciples, he was going to go away to prepare a place for them, but that he would return to get them so that they would be where he is. Amen. This is the future hope. This is the hope. This is the promise of Christ proven by his own resurrection. And those who have received Jesus Christ's offer of eternal life will be made alive and that's proclaimed in verse 22. But those who reject Christ, as Paul says, well, they will experience an eternal separation or death in torment away from God. The Bible calls this punishment the second death. The resurrection is an invitation to receive what Christ has prepared for you and for me. The resurrection of Jesus offers us eternal life. It's an amazing gift. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing truth. The gospel in a nutshell is real. It's true. It's alive. And it's powerful. We're not to be ashamed of it. It's the power of God to the salvation for those who would believe. So therefore, in the resurrection of Jesus, he makes an offer to everybody to come to come to Christ and to enter into his resurrected life. But that gift is something each and every one of us needs to receive. We have a choice to make. One choice. There's one God, there's one faith, there's one true God, there's one true faith, there's one true Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. And there's only one decision we have to make in life. God hasn't made it difficult for us. Not difficult at all. It's a series of one. There's one God. There's one Savior. And there's one decision. Paul encourages each of us to choose Christ, to choose life, to choose Jesus, to choose resurrection over death and the second death. Everyone receives an invitation, particularly in the West, particularly in our age group, I mean, I'm saddened that young people don't even know who Jesus is apart from a swear word. Boy, the church has got a lot of evangelism to do. We need to go out and declare Christ is alive. Hallelujah. But what have we done with our invitation? Jesus is alive. He's calling each and every one of us to receive him today. Are you and am I made alive with Christ to spend eternity with him? Or have we said, no, I don't. I don't need you. I can do it on my own. I don't need you, Jesus. I don't need this gift. I'm not convinced. When we believe, when we trust in the scriptures, when we trust in the evidence, when we trust in the testimony of Christians, what's the secret? Jesus is alive. When we believe it and receive it, then the light goes on. Faith first, light second. We come to Jesus first. We repent he will switch on something in us and it all makes sense. And then we know who we are in Christ Jesus. We know our eternal destiny. Paul declares that Christ has risen from the dead. Jesus is the first of all who will follow him. Christ's resurrection is the first fruit. You and I, all of us, are the second fruit. We will be following him into this resurrection. 
just as death came to all people through one man. The scriptures are true. Just as death came to people through one man, and his name was Adam, we are programmed with Adam's DNA. We call that original sin. But praise be to God, when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, we take on his DNA. We take on his life. The life we had in Adam is dead, but we take on the life of Christ and we become like him. Amen? We know that Christ has won the victory. He's already defeated every power that there is, but it will become so visible when he comes again. The reason why he's not here now is for the likes of you and me and those who are watching to give us an opportunity to come into the kingdom. He's holding off. Christians say he's tarrying, he's waiting, he's waiting for the moment when he's going to wrap it all up. But in this period of time, that one decision, do I choose Christ or do I reject him? That's the one decision and it's a life or death decision. Once we've made it for Christ, then we become secure. Jesus will and we are saved as long as we remain in him. Jesus will deliver the kingdom. He will deliver us to his Father. Gosh, what a great day that's going to be. We will rise with Christ and, and he will present us as his glorious bride to his Father. And he'll say, look, look at my bride. Look at all these people in the bride of the new Jerusalem. Two brides. And we will dwell with him forever. Hallelujah. The resurrection of Jesus I hope I've convinced you, is essential and central to our Christian faith. Christ's resurrection is proof that the scriptures are true and it's proof more so that the promises of God contained in the scriptures relating to our salvation and our destiny and how to get there is also true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's simple. One God, one Savior, one decision, one way to the Father. Jesus Christ the Lord. And the resurrection proves it. Jesus Christ is alive. Hallelujah. And Jesus Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. We've said that Jesus is Lord of Lords and he's King of Kings. And he's those things because he has risen from the grave. And when he comes, we will meet him and know him face to face. And all of our hopes will be realized in that moment. It will be incredible. And we will reign with him for eternity. Amen. 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 It really is a happy day, isn't it? Shall we stand in worship in our last song? Just getting us all together.
anything about that message impacted you, if there's anyone here who is not confident, not sure,